this is what has become part of the training class and stood the field well inspection manual. Uh, it's kind of a condensed version, but there's a lot of material here that's somewhat different. If you would open up this manual, when you look on this uh, first page, at the bottom of that first page, where it says May 2010, well, you also have something that I've put in there. This is, uh, this is material for the new revision, the new edition that will be coming out later this year. And so this is the material that we're going to use to go over in this class until we get up to the welding procedures. Okay, so if you would take this handout out of the book, the one that has 2011 edition at the bottom, go to, that, uh, go to the next page on that, you see table of contents. Now, I, I worked in construction with several people who are in this office, uh, so I mean, I understand that you get on a bridge job, uh, and this job may last two or two and a half years. The welding on that job may be two days, four days, then that's it. So you may have you may have pile splices, then you may have uh, bearing seat welding, uh, then SIP welding, and then you may not be around welding again for two or three years. Okay, so hopefully this will be a good reference tool so that when you do get around welding you'll have something that's reliable, something that's now enforceable to make sure that the welding is done in accordance with specifications. And hopefully you will be able to use this table of contents to guide you through this book on the welding that's getting ready to take place on your job. Okay, let's take a look at the introduction on the next page. Now this manual was put together primarily for the construction inspector. There's some additional material that has been added on this new revision. Now the welding procedures are not in place yet, but uh, the, the material in this section that we're going over has been already added to this that's specifically for bridge maintenance. Okay, so it's primarily for the construction inspector, the welding contractor, and bridge maintenance personnel with this newest revision. If you look at these two web addresses, Right now, this, this older version, uh, the May 2010, can be found at one of these websites. And then the individual welding procedures that are found within this manual can be found at the other website. Probably May of this year is when the next revision will be out. We will send out an email to all resident engineers. And at that time, then you will be able to get the updated version online. Okay, so if you're out on a job site, uh, uh, Contractor, welding contractor shows up, he doesn't have the procedures, the only thing he has to do is get on the website, print them out. If he doesn't have access to the internet, contact us and we will print those out for him and hand deliver. You will go to this next section, the next page under general information, the reference standards. What I've done here is connected the dots. Okay, so if a welding contractor thinks that he is not uh, he does not have to follow the guidelines of AWS. This proves him wrong. Okay, so in our specification, it states in 440-7, first of all, that only weld where called for on the plans, that if you have a coating, it gives three different ways to remove that coating, and then that next paragraph, it says that weld all structural steel in the shop or in the field for bridges, and at the bottom of the paragraph, in accordance with the bridge welding code. Okay, so what we're going to go over here are various excerpts that I pulled out of the Bridge Welding Code and I've included in this manual so that you now have these direct quotes that you can use to enforce the, the quality requirements of the welding. Now, something else that's been included, now you will notice on this third paragraph where it talks about if, if you have coding, this is out of our specification, if you have coding and needs to be removed either by SP6, SP2, SP3, well that's, uh, in effect, that is either sandblasting, hand tool cleaning, or power tool cleaning. Well, the only way that you can actually enforce that is if you have those standards. And one thing that, that I had to get cleared through Raleigh because of copyright issues was making sure that these standards were included in, in this manual. So now in Appendix B, 
in this manual, you will find those SSPC standards. And in addition to 2, 3, and 6, you also have SSPC SP1, which is uh, solvent cleaning. So if you have a situation where you have, you have grease uh, on a girder, you do not want to blast, and that SSPC SP6 will tell you that if there's grease, the first you have to remove that by solvent cleaning, and then you blast. If that's the if that's the method that that contractor chooses to remove that coating. Now notice here that and out of our specification, and we're also going to look at this in the bridge welding code. It, it addresses the same issues about how you get this coating off. There's nothing here about burning it off with a torch. Okay, and I'm sure I know. I know there's one man in here anyway that has dealt with a contractor who said, I can burn this off with a torch. And, and his resident engineer decided to have that weld removed because, the, because the, uh, the, the welding contractor was instructed to weld over the coating. Okay, so right here it says that needs to be removed. Now also in this paragraph it says, or other applicable welding code. Uh, the, only, the only excerpts we have in here are from the bridge welding code. But if you have something like encasement pipe that's going under the roadway, uh, welding on that's taken care of with the D11 structure code. If you have stainless steel handrail that's on your bridge, uh, that's covered under a stainless steel welding code. Okay, so there are, there are other codes that we have to deal with, but most of what you're going to see and most of what we're going to talk about is the bridge welding code. Now, qualification of personnel, just very quickly, that's kind of old news. 2006, a special provision was put in place. Anybody that comes out on a job must be tested by the steel section. That's our department. Okay, at one time, they could, they could take a Georgia DOT certification. They could take a certification from, uh, from another testing agency, and we would accept that. But any job that was led after 2006, and so everybody has been grandfathered in, uh, those welding certifications lasted five years. We're in 2011. Anybody that comes out on your job must have a certification card from the steel section of, of NCDOT materials and tests. Okay, it's the only kind of certification that's acceptable now on NCDOT projects. On this next page, this is where the enforcement comes in on these welding procedures. Here is the special provision, 72109. Any job let after 721 of 09 must have a uh, must be governed by a welding procedure. Okay, so if he comes out and we're looking at the welding procedures right here in, in just a few minutes. So if he comes out on the job and he does he's getting ready to weld up an H pile, he doesn't have a welding procedure with him, then he's not allowed to start welding. Now right here it states he doesn't have to use hours, but he has to submit something for approval. 30 days before he starts welding. So if he hasn't done that, then he's going to have to use hours. Okay, now we're going to get into the bridge welding code. We connected the dots. You, I, I showed you where our specification states that they must use the bridge welding code. Under this workmanship, I want you to notice this AWS D1.5 section 3.1.3. All of these are direct quotes out of the bridge welding code. So if there's something here that's going on, you recognize it, you understand it, and they are in violation, you can stop them with this document. If you have trouble and he doesn't want to stop, give us a call and we will come out and give you support. Okay, this first paragraph is talking about if the temperature's below zero, they can't weld. If surfaces are wet, exposed to rain, snow, high wind velocities, uh, welders are exposed to inclement conditions, they're not allowed to weld. Now, I, well, I had a situation not too long ago where the welding contractor insisted that he could not deviate from his schedule. He had too much work. And so he can do this, okay? He actually, he actually nailed up several two-by-fours, stretched plastic across it, took a torch and dried off the steel where he's getting ready to weld. He changed the conditions, okay? He's permitted to do that. Uh, even this, uh, if temperature's below zero, uh, I heard of a situation in the, uh, in the northeast where a welding contractor was faced with that. It was on some pipe welding. He actually built a tent around the pipe, put a, a bullet heater inside that tent, raised that ambient temperature in the area where he was welding. 
Okay, so he changed the conditions so that he could continue work. Now, this next paragraph, <coughs> uh, section 3.2.1, this is another one that's, that, in effect, is talking about that you should not weld over coated material. Okay, so there, once, our specification said that you should not do that. Okay, this is talking, first of all, it's talking about um, surfaces and edges to be welded, should be smooth, uniform. That's more for a fabricator. That is more for bridge maintenance. Okay, but then it continues to say surfaces to be welded and surfaces adjacent to weld, free from loose or thick meal scale, slag, rust, moisture, grease, or other foreign material. Okay, other foreign material might be galvanized coating, might be paint. Okay, none of that can be in place. If they're talking about uh, meal scale that, that will withstand vigorous wire brushing, then that's okay. Okay, now in thermal cutting, um, it, talks, it talks about the, the, uh, the texture of the, of the uh, edges. Again, this is more for bridge maintenance. Uh, it does say that you're supposed to use a mechanical guide, okay, but there is something here that uh, if, for example, you, uh, you find that there's a very high quality welder who has a high skill level and he's, he can produce a cut uh, that, that you feel like you're satisfied with, then the engineer, as it states right here, the engineer can say it's okay for you to hand cut this. Okay. Other than that, he has to use a mechanical guide. If he's cutting an H file, he should he should be clamping, uh, for example, a piece of angle on this H file and running his torch across it so that he gets a good smooth cut. Now, if he can prove that he has a skill level to get a good smooth cut, other than that, then the engineer can say I'll, I will let you hand cut. Okay, the bottom paragraph, reentrant corners, that is for bridge maintenance also. That is fabrication issues in the field. Okay, next page, still under workmanship. Now this is talking about a gap. This is uh, primarily dealing with uh, where you might have to deal with, with girders that are, that are uh, welded to bearing plates. And it's talking about how close this fit up needs to be. Okay, so if you have a if you have a girder comes out on the job, and you're going to, going to weld that down to a, a bearing plate, and let's say for example, sometimes we have we have what's called a, a flange tilt issue. Now it's, it can't be very much, and I'm, it's exaggerated just a little bit. But let's say for example, you, you've got an eighth of an inch gap. And this, is, this typically calls for a 5 16 weld. Well, you measure the weld by the length of that leg. So if it's 5 16 on this leg and 5 16 on this leg, it's a 5 16 weld. Now, let me explain what this is talking about when it says that you should increase the size of the weld to compensate for this gap. To say there's no gap on this side, but you were, you were there and you were looking at it. And over on, over on the other side, there was a 1 8 of an inch gap. Well, this is what happens because the what the welding coach is talking about is this fusion line. Okay, so you are okay here. You've got five sixteenths of an inch well, but you have an eighth inch gap here. Okay, so you've got five sixteenths here. Okay, but you've only got three sixteenths over here because of that eighth inch gap because that's how long your fusion line is. So that's why the bridge welding code tells you that when that happens, you have a gap like that, you need to increase your weld size to compensate for that gap. Okay, so a 5 16 weld then needs to be a 7 16 weld if there's an 8 inch gap. So you have to be able to inspect that before they get started or he will cover that up and you'll never know it. Okay, the, the uh, sub-paragraph under that, no filler plates are allowed. I don't think you will run into that. Another bridge maintenance issue. You're putting, you are putting things together. You have a gap. Uh, we actually had a, a welding contractor that, that had a pipe pile. And he had trouble with the spit up and he found a small piece of rebar and he wrapped halfway, halfway around his pipe pile. One of our guys just happened out on the job and there was no inspector around, 
and, uh, and so that's the only way we caught that. Okay, this next section is talking about groove welds. Now you have fillet welds, and that's primarily going to be where you have girders welded to your sole plates. But now we're going to talk just a second about groove welds. This is talking about pile weld, whether it's H piles or pipe piles. Okay, so that's where you want to you want uh, a structural member to act like it's continuous. Okay, you have a splice in it. So this is called a groove well. Now what this is talking about is what kind of fit up you need on this H pile or on this pipe pile. And what it states right here is that this, this alignment needs to be within 10% of the thickness of that material. Okay, so what is 10% what is of an inch? Okay, that will be less than an eighth. I haven't seen a pile that's an inch thick. Uh, the piles that I've seen are you know, between 3 eighths and 5 eighths. So less than a sixteenth of an inch of misalignment is all that's allowed. Steve Walton called me at, out on a job one time. The inspector reminds me of what Lee was talking about. The inspector noticed that there was some misalignment. The welding contractor convinced him that it was within specification. And so he continued. The inspector made a note of it. Um, the resident engineer decided to do a PDA on it. It failed. And so they called Steve Walton. I went out with Steve the day that they pulled this pile out. Okay, now when, we, when you're looking down on that pile, they had good alignment here, good alignment across the web, good alignment across half of that flange. But then there was a bend in that flange, and he didn't have all the right equipment with him. He didn't have, he didn't have a clamp, he didn't have a wedge or anything like that to pull things in alignment. When, when we pulled that pile out, there was complete dislocation of the flange out at this point and the welder just went ahead and welded it up just like that. And so he had to cut everything loose. And, and the welding contractor was standing there. And uh, so, so he had to go ahead and cut, cut everything loose. And, and they had to redo the pile at no cost to the department. Okay, so that's what this paragraph is talking about. It's talking about what kind of fit up that you have to have on pipe piles and on H piles. And so less than a sixteenth of an inch, on most, you just do the math, and uh, it's going to be uh, around a sixteenth of an inch or less in most situations. This next section is talking about tack welds. Um, if you're seeing some ugly tack welds, well, we're going to talk about visual criteria here in just a minute. Well, they're supposed to be the same quality as the final welds. So if he says, well, I'm going to cover it up with good weld, no, he, he needs to make repairs. If he's got problems with his tack welds, he needs to make, make repairs to the tack welds before he continues. And then temporary welds, same WPS requirements on this next paragraph. And what that's talking about is if, if he's building false work, we don't want that false work to fail uh, before it does its job. And so um, if it's under situations where he needs to preheat, he still needs to preheat, even though it's temporary. He still needs to have a welding procedure, even though it's temporary. No temporary welds in tension areas. Uh, the biggest problem you're going to have here is if you have a continuous fan girder, you've got, you've got your end vents, you've got an interior bent, and of course what happens, that interior bent is, is uh, pushing up, you've got splices here, and that puts tension on that top flange. And so what you're going to see in the plans will be no weld zone. And what's going to happen a lot of times, what we've seen, uh, the, the contractors setting the SIPs are going to get out there and th they're going to say, well, I just need to weld a couple of pieces of plate or a couple of pieces of angle so that I can get my SIP angles pulled up in place. And there's, but there's no welding in those tension areas. Even though it's temporary, they're still not allowed to weld. If they do, then you need to call us and we will bring testing equipment out and we will do some post visuals and we'll make sure that no damage has been done to that flange. Weld profiles. This, uh, this first paragraph under weld profiles is talking about convexity. There's a calculation here. Again, this is primarily what you're going to be dealing with will be a, a, where they actually weld 
uh, the steel girders to the bearing plates. And so what this is talking about where you have that situation, if it's a fat weld, that's the convection. And typically you're talking about it needs to be less than an eighth of an inch. When you start when you run these calculations based on a 5 16 weld, that's going to be less than an eighth of an inch sticking up. So if you're seeing some fat welds like that, give us a call and we'll come out and we'll do some close visuals and, and we'll run some calculations and we'll make sure that he is within specification. Now when it comes, the next paragraph, when it comes to groove welds, it's no longer called convexity. It's called weld reinforcement. And a small amount of weld reinforcement is desirable. It's talking about this area right here, from this point to this point. A small amount is desirable. But as it states right here, no more than one eighth of an inch. Okay, so it's a small amount. So if you start seeing fat, ugly welds on your H files, on your pipe tiles, you can, you can put a piece of eighth inch metal here and here run a straight edge across that. If that straight edge touches, he's got too much. We're going to talk here in just a minute about how to, how to fix these things. Okay, on the next page, how are we going to fix these things? Preparing the welds. Now, the contractor has the option, and he's going to make different decisions based on exactly what the, the defect is. But as it states in that top paragraph, the contractor has the option to either repair or completely remove. Most of the time he's going to, want to uh, going to want to repair. A lot of times he may want to repair when what we're going to talk about here in a minute, he's, not, he's going to have to remove it. Okay, so how do you fix these things? You know what it's been in the past, when we had the field weld inspection class, we had statements. But you guys were not able to use those statements to, to enforce getting these things done in the field. Okay, so when we would talk about excessive convection, we would talk about overlap. What I used to talk about was, well, how do you fix it? You have a problem, now how do you fix it? Well, if it's, if it's excessive convexity, you grind it. If it's overlap, you grind it. Well, it's never been, you know, the, the field weld inspection manual was correct in what it was telling you to do, but now you have the direct quote from the code book. Okay, so when you get out there with a contractor, you don't have to say, well, it's because Randy said this is how you fix it, or it's because the field weld inspection manual has this paragraph in it. No, it's because the bridge welding code in this section says this is how you will fix it. Okay, and I think a lot of times he's just going to start listening to what you tell him once he realizes what you're working <laughs> from, once he realizes that you have direct quotes from the bridge welding code. Okay, excessive, con uh, the, the first one, Overlap or excessive convexity, you grind it. The next one, undersize. That's typically what you what you're going to have with the with the pile welding, whether it's a, a H files or pipe files. What happens is they're welding these things up. They think they're finished, and a lot of times they'll leave a low place on the top side of that weld. Okay, a lot of times. Uh, <clears throat> Let's talk about what overlap is. Well, overlap, this is the face of the well. This is the toe of the well. And so the, the AWS definition for overlap is any time the face of this well extends beyond the toe of the well. Okay? It's usually when they get in a hurry and they try to apply too much well too quickly. Okay, any time that happens, well, the fix is to grind that off. Okay, so they're going to grind, it, grind that overlap out of the way. Well, now the weld's too small. Okay, so that's what this is also talking about. Uh, undersized welds. Well, it also makes reference to 311. Well, they have to, they can't just grind it off and go, then they have to make sure it's clean, and then, then they apply more weld. Excessive porosity, that has to be removed. A small amount of porosity is acceptable. You probably need to give us a call unless the contractor says, I, I will go ahead and cut the weld out and fix it. 
Okay, this tells us to cut it out. That's the only way to fix porosity. It's so complex as far as as far as rating porosity because it's a it's a page and a half long in in a bridge welding code. Uh, small amounts are acceptable, but only in a certain length. And so we actually have a porosity gauge where we measure the diameter. We measure uh, a 12 inch length and if there's X amount of porosity and it just goes on and on for a page and a half. So if you run into porosity issues, it's probably because either he's not a very good welder or he's been welding over coating or he's been welding in the rain. Those are the common things that will bring about porosity. We've got one welder right here. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, weld cleaning, in process welding. This is one that you're going to run into, for example, on whenever they're welding the girders to the bearing plates again, that's typically three passes. Okay, make sure when they run that first pass and they're getting about a 3 sixteenths weld and that needs to be 5 sixteenths, make sure it's, it's clean. Right here it says not only remove the slag, it also says it needs to be brushed clean before they apply this pass. Brush clean, remove slag before they apply this pass. That's what inner pass cleaning is talking about. And then when they get finished, Biggest problem we have with this one is on the welding of SIPs. Like it says right here, cleaning of completed welds, slag shall be removed, uh, clean by brushing. You cannot inspect a weld if it still has a slag on it. You cannot determine what kind of quality you have. And I understand that an SIP weld is, is that becomes false work. But you don't want these SIP welds to fail before the concrete sets up. Okay, this next section talking about preheat. This is a, a, a lot of these things are additions from, from uh, the old version. Um, when they preheat, well, what, to what extent? Well, this next paragraph at the very bottom says in three, uh, for three inches in all directions. Okay, you read the rest of the paragraph and it will tell you, you know, under the conditions where you know the base metal is not to the temperature it needs to be in accordance with the welding procedure in accordance with the ambient conditions. So when they heat it up, do they just heat it up right next to where they're getting ready to weld? No, it says three inches. Three inches in all directions. That bottom paragraph on that page, if they're in a situation where it's thin metal and typically they would not have to preheat, but it's a cold day, um, it's below 32, to the steel's below 32 degrees, they're coming out the first thing in the morning and they have to preheat to 70 degrees. Okay, even if the welding procedure says that they don't have to, based on the thickness of the material, if it's below, if the metal is below 32 degrees, they still have to preheat to 70. And as you can imagine, that's not much. It's run a torch across it, get it warmed up a little bit, and that, that keeps it from, from actually freezing that weld metal. Okay, that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to do is reduce the cooling rate of the weld metal. That's what you do when you preheat. Because if you don't warm up the metal, then the heat's taken from the weld metal so quickly the weld becomes brittle and it's subject to cracking. Electrode storage on this next page. Hermetically sealed container. Uh, all welds need to be delivered in a hermetically sealed container. The problems we've been running into is, especially in today's times, budgets are tight, um, and especially on bridge maintenance jobs, we've had welding rods show up in plastic containers, still shrink wrapped, and well, they're not acceptable. It's not a hermetically sealed container. Hermetically sealed container is a tin box, it's got a zip top on it, just like a potted meat can. It's the only thing that will successfully hold out that moisture. And so these, the rods were not packaged properly to to begin with, uh, to, to be in accordance with the code. Yes? Well, we order them, not for bridge maintenance. Uh -huh. We order them for the depot. They're done in those plastic containers. We That's are still fighting that. That's the NCDOT depot. Yes, I know. <laughs> Steve Walton is still fighting that. Steve Walton's metals just engineer. Got on, just got on in the other day. Uh, they're not supposed to be used on bridges. They are, they are, not, they are not using. Uh, a consumable electrode that's in accordance with the bridge welding code. Okay, according to what we're reading right here. And that's the reason 
the AWS doesn't want you using that on bridge work is because th there's no there's no way that they can guarantee that excessive moisture has not already been absorbed into that flux. Okay, but yes, I, I understand that. That's one of the situations that we're talking about. That's one of the battles that Steve Walton has been fighting for years. I mean, that's where I order my wheels and rods from. It's a budget issue, and, and yes, we're, we're working on that, and we haven't made much ground. Okay, now when it comes to once these welding rods show up on the job site, there's a, the, the clock starts running. They take these things out of the hermetically sealed container. According to these guidelines, uh, most rods are four hours. If it's got a, uh, an R at the end of it, so 7018HR, that R is for moisture resistance. Okay, so those are nine hour rods. Okay, so once they take those out of the oven, then the clock starts turning. They've got those in their, their, their pouch that, that they're using. They're, they're pulling one rod at a time. Okay, let's say, for example, um, it's a four-hour rod. They've been working for three hours. They get ready to go to lunch. They take these out, and they put them back in the rod oven. Well, what it's telling you right here is now that those rods that have been out for, for three hours, now they're re-drying is what's taking place. So they're putting them back. Uh, so what this paragraph is telling us, they're putting these back in the holding oven, 250 degrees, and it says for four hours. Then they've re-dried. And they're allowed to do that one time. Okay. Now, first of all, how do you know it's 250 degrees? <clears throat> asphalt thermometer. Good way to check those rod ovens. Asphalt thermometer. Um, another thing is, I know that you're real busy at times, but if you think there's some violations going on and you don't have time to keep up with it, give us a call. And if we have time, we'll come out and we'll give you some support. We'll talk to the welding contractor. We'll try to find out what's going on because I understand when you start looking at this and okay he took them he took these things out at this time and then he put them in his put them in his pouch and used them and exposure limits and time, uh, so give us a call if you think there's a violation and we'll come out and support you okay well acceptance criteria all wells shall be visually inspected okay then it starts giving us some, some additional things here. These are some of the, some of the things that, that you pro, if you've been to any of these other classes uh, dealing with welding, you've heard us say, well, no cracks are allowed. Well, why? Well, it's not because Gary Bristow said so. It's because of bridge welding code right here. So now you have it. You have that section of the bridge welding code in your hands. Okay, make sure there's thorough fusion. Make sure everything is filled to the full cross section. That's talking about when your H files and pipe files, make sure this is filled completely up. That's what that full cross section is talking about. Make sure the weld, weld profiles are in conformance with 3.6. We've already gone over that. 3.6 is included in this that we just talked about. In primary members, this is talking about undercut. Now, first it talks about in a transverse location, one one hundredth of an inch. You should not be in a situation where you have transverse location. There's your girder, there's your sole plate, this is longitudinal. You're not going to be welding across the bottom of that thing, that would be transverse. Okay, so this one one hundredth of an inch, this is something they have to deal with in a shop, this is something bridge maintenance has to deal with. Anytime they, they're in a situation, they're having to weld stiffeners in, uh, at some point on that flange, then they have a situation where they're actually transverse to the direction of stress. And if there's any, for, the, for you guys in bridge maintenance, if you are transverse to the direction of stress, uh, if you see undercut, it needs to be repaired. Okay, if you can even see it. So don't even worry about measuring it. Because like it says right here, one one hundredth of an inch. For all other cases, just a thirty second of an inch. Now we have undercut gauges. So really, if, if you can see something and you can take your finger and hook on it, you've got a thirty second of an inch. If you're unsure, give us a call and we'll bring the undercut gauge out. It's about a $30 or $35 gauge, otherwise we would be handing those things out. Okay, so if you, if you have some undercut, in most cases the, the inspector just uh, brings it to the contractor's attention and he fixes it. Okay, then it's not an issue. If you have trouble getting it fixed, give us a call. We'll come out and bring that undercut <coughs> gauge with us. Porosity, like I mentioned before, 
page and a half, too complex to put in here. Uh, the bottom paragraph on that page, underrun, underrun. Very interesting. I've had, uh, I've had contractors, uh, some, of got, some of you guys know what my job entails, others, others don't. I go to all these different steel shops. I take care of pedestrian bridges for one thing, various metal products that go into our steel bridges. I used to work in a bridge plant years ago. Uh, and so I've been into this. It's usually in the, in the shops that we have to deal with this underrun, but now we're running into it when the, when the contractors find out about this, welding contractors, they start leaning on this. So I want to explain exactly what this underrun means. Okay, there's your weld. It's supposed to be a 5 16 weld, and, th and it's on your bearing plate. There's your girder. It's supposed to be a 5 16 and maybe right here, it's a, it, this thing is, let's say, to make the figures easy, let's say it's 10 inches long. And half of it's just a quarter inch weld. And the contractor, if, if he finds out about this statement, he may say, well, I'm allowed to underrun the size of the weld by, by a sixteenth of an inch. Well, that is what it says, but at the end of the paragraph, it says, for 10% of the length. Okay? So if there's, if, the, if he's got one inch on that weld, that he's just a quarter inch under, or, or he's a quarter inch weld, sixteenth under, then he's okay. Okay, so yes, he can underrun that for 10% of the length. So now you have it right here in your hand. You've got something to argue with him about whenever he says something about, I can underrun that weld as far as the size. Okay, the next page, stud welding. Uh, this is another one of those issues when it comes to automatic stud, stud welding. So if you're putting in an MSE wall, uh, you may have to deal with automatic stud welding. Give us a call. We want to come out and support you on that. Again, it's a page and a half. They have to, they have to weld a couple of studs, do some uh, destructive testing. Uh, some of the guys in here, uh, I see Wright shaking his head. Some of the guys in here probably dealt with it. If you're not familiar with it, give us a call. We'll bring the code book with us. We'll make sure the contractor and everybody's on the same page. Okay, now here are some other things about stud welding that applies whether it's going to be automatic or whether it's going to be manual because one of the main reasons we put this in here is because we have a lot of manual stud welding. Okay, so all of these things uh, like this uh, 7.4.1, free from rust, rust pit, scale, oil, moisture, and deleterious matter. Okay, the next, uh, next section shall not be painted or galvanized or cadmium plated. Uh, the next section, at the option of the contractor, he can fill it well. Okay, so if he just got a few studs, he's not going to want to get an automatic machine on the job site. Okay, now in that case, then he needs to use our welding procedure. Now when it comes to automatic stud welding, we do not have a welding procedure for that, and we're not going to have one. We want to come out, we want to witness, and we want to make sure everything's done correctly. Okay, so we have the welding procedure. One of the main things here on the stud welding that, that, that we want to point out, these, these studs have a protrusion on the bottom of them that's specifically designed for the automatic welding process, for resistance welding. Okay, if they're going to weld these things with a stick, they need to grind that off. And that's what this paragraph is talking about. The stud base shall be prepared so that the base of the stud fits against the base metal. And that's exactly what it's talking about. That protrusion that's designed for resistance welding needs to be removed. Okay, the next section, all rust and mill scale at the location of the stud shall be removed. So if he's welding, uh, whether it's on the girder, and they had to cut a few studs off, I've seen that a lot, and they want to replace those studs, it needs to be rust free, uh, whether it's on a, a MSE wall, um, and he's putting all the studs up or he's just replacing a few, same thing. It needs to be rust free. Notice it says, it doesn't say most of the rust. What does it say? All. All of the rust, all of the mill scale removed. Now equipment requirements. Guys, this is pretty much, a lot of this is common sense. Uh, if they're just coming out to weld the, weld the sole plates up, then, you know, if they have their weld machine, they've got, a, they've got a power tool grinder so that they can remove any coating. They've got a, a, a torch so that they can preheat. 
they're probably okay. If they're going to do uh, power welding, don't let them get to a situation where where that they can't get the plan just pulled in place, and they and, and they tell you that well I don't have a clamp with me. Okay, because they uh, according to our policies, they have to have all of the equipment necessary to perform the work within specifications. And so if they if they're locking a clamp or a wedge or whatever it takes to get the flanges of that uh, H pile pulled into place so that it's in within specification, then they need to go home discontinue operations for that day and come back when they do have a clamp or the proper tools to get the job done. Okay, the next, uh, the next page, this is actually the, the appendix and there, was, there, there have been a lot of additions to this. Uh, the main thing I want you to, to be aware of here, you've got all the contact information for the steel section, including cell phone numbers. So some of these guys uh, you may have dealt with before, maybe that's who you want to contact. Okay, so you've got his information right here. Uh, office numbers are not very good. So if you want to get in touch with somebody, I would recommend calling the cell phone number because we're on the road all the time. We're not office personnel. Uh, C. David Green, he's, the, he's our boss's boss. A lot, most of you guys know him. Uh, if you've got any uh, significant issues, he's the one to call. Uh, if, you've got, if you've got maybe a little bit lesser issues, call Steve Walton. If you've already dealt with us and you know it's some kind of a welding topic and you need some support, then give one of the technicians a call. Okay? Okay, this next page, just FYI, is what this next next page is for. It's, it's all of the revisions. Uh, just about everything's on here. I still have a lot of welding procedures that are in development. Um, what I want you to do is again watch for that email that will be sent out that will tell everyone that the new addition, uh, that the new addition is available. So you have most of it right here in your hand. Okay, now I've got a couple welding procedures that I just want to go over in depth, and then we're just going to t uh, just skim the surface on everything else. And we're actually going to get out of here early today. This first welding procedure, H pile. The main thing I want to talk about on this, I want to make sure everybody understands what back gouging means. When they weld these H piles up, the engineers have designed these things with the assumption that this is a full penetration weld, which means there's, there are no voids, there's no slag, there's no light diffusion inside. Okay, so I'm going to blow it up here. Let's say that's the, this is where your two flanges are coming together. Okay, when they weld this up, they're going to weld, that they're going to have their bevel side, they're going to uh, put weld in here, then they're going to put adjacent beads. Now, when they go to the other side, Back gouge. I want you to look. Now, most of the data on this welding procedure is technical data that's for us and for the welding contractor, with the exception of this procedure and this statement when it's talking about roof treatment. So, if you would look at that statement, back gouge with the grinder to sound metal prior to welding. And this is right out of the bridge welding code. This is how this is supposed to be handled. So, when they once they weld this one side up, what you're going to see. Right in the back side of this, you're going to see slag. You're going to see perhaps the line of this, uh, of, of the top flange, maybe the line of the bottom flange. You may even see a little bit of weld metal, but you're still going to see these other anomalies. Okay, and back gouging gets rid of all of that. So once they weld one side up, back gouge means come in here with a grinder, Grind all of that out to sound metal. So they're looking at nothing but shiny metal. Okay, no, no slag, no fusion line, nothing but shiny metal. And then they put this back weld in. Then they're complete. And that's what the engineer's intentions are. Is that the only way they can do that? That's with a grinder? It, that's the only way they can get it to, to uh, they can do it with air arc. Right. Air arcs permitted. Okay. Yes. Good question. We do have a few. We do have a few welding contractors that use air arc. 
Okay, another, now this, the comments on this page, the comments are, are, are actually right out of the, either our specification or the bridge welding code, and they've just been brought forward to the welding procedure for convenience. Okay, so everything that you see here, you're going to see other places. But it's for your convenience, it's for the welding contractor's convenience, and it's going to be relevant on each welding procedure. Okay, so remove all coating, rust, dirt, mill scale within one inch of the area to be welded, and so on and so on. And it's going to be repetitious from one welding to procedure, one welding procedure to the other. Turn over to the next page. Now something that has been included on these welding procedures, and to me it's one of the most important things about the welding procedure, and that's the details, and it's the most helpful thing to the contractor. And it's, and it's going to be very helpful to the inspector. Because it's not a perfect world, okay? It's not a perfect world. And I can tell you right now, a few things are changing in the revision. This 45 degrees that we're talking about right here. Okay, there's a tolerance. What you're seeing right here is minus 0 plus 10. Well, there's actually a minus 5 there that we have not been giving the welding contractor. Well, Steve Walton, on this revision, has asked me to put everything in there. I've always liked to give the inspectors just a little bit. So that if we walk out there and the, and the contractor says, well, you know, it, it, it's close, how much are you going to give me? Then we actually had a little bit to give him, okay? But on the new revision, it will be 45 degrees plus 10 minus 5. Okay, so if he's slightly under 45, then he, he's still within the specification. But now, I actually do have an angle finder. And if you run into something and you, you think he's out of specification, give me a call. I'll bring my angle finder out and, and we'll look at it real close. Okay, so that's on, that's on the uh, bevel. Now we've got these other two dimensions, 0 to 1 8, 0 to 1 8. One is a root opening, and these are not either or. These are tolerances. Okay, so for example, this is his flange. Okay, and at this point, let's say, let's say he's got that thing beveled to a point. Okay, this is called the root face dimension. So if he's got that beveled to a point, then that's zero. Okay, if it's, ground, if it's got a little bit of a flatness at the bottom of that bevel, and let's say it's an eighth of an inch, well then that's where your zero to one eighth is on one of these dimensions. That other zero to one eighth is for how much opening he's allowed. Okay, so this is this is what we like to see the contractor doing. He will bevel that to a point. Okay, I'm going to try to do a three-dimensional here. Now he's he's putting his pile together. Okay, but he's touching out here. Well, that's zero. Okay, so he's still within specification. But now on this end, let's say he's three sixteenths. Well, he's out of spec. But if he's got a point beveled all the way across this thing, well, then the only thing he needs to do is flatten that out a little bit on this end, let that close up until he's got at least an eighth right here, and then on the flat edge of that bevel on this side, it might be flat just for a short distance, but it's no more than one eighth here, then he's within spec in all directions. Okay, so that's why you've got zero to one eight twice. One is for the opening, one is for the landing at the bottom of that bevel. Root face dimension is what that's called. Okay, now we're going to run through. Uh, let's take a look at the photograph. I've tried to give uh, good, bad, and good weld, bad weld illustrations. The biggest problem that we run into with these H piles is uh, at the very end of that flange, they have trouble getting that filled out completely to the full cross-section of the member's joint, like the specification states. It needs to look like the, the bottom. Uh, anybody who has an engineering degree will tell you there's a lot of stress, isn't there, Ross? Right out on the end of that flange. And they, they need to build that out to the full cross-section, have no notches, no hooks, no points. It needs to look like that bottom photograph, filled out completely in a nice, smooth transition. Okay, the next welding procedure, 
Just notice on that that uh, this is on the uh, steel girder bearing plate. Just notice that I've, been, I've included here 250 degrees in, approx in, the, the, uh, in the proximity of the elastomeric bearing. Biggest problem you're going to run into there when you turn over to the photographs. Jeremy Guy took this picture. Several of you guys know him. Best illustration of overlap, uh, one of the best that I think I've ever seen. That's the biggest problem you're going to run into. It's 5 16 weld. He's going to come out there with 8 inch welding rod and he's going to want to uh, produce this 5 16 weld in one pass. What happens? It gets fat, it starts lapping over, and he gets that overlap condition that you see in that photograph. Okay, pipe pile is the next one. I want to spend just a couple of minutes here and then we're, we are, we've got a couple of slides to look at and we're done. Okay, on a pipe pile. Same thing on the comments and just turn over to the detail. We've got two details here. This is something that Steve Walton wants me to make sure I, I stress because we've run into problems with it. When you have a, a, a pipe pile splice and you're not going to run into it very often in this part of the state. He has to use biking bar and that's what uh, that's what this illustration is depicting. The use of a biking bar, that's what that welding symbol is talking about. The use of a biking bar, mandatory with pipe pile welding. Now he may tell you that he can weld it up. Well, if he was working in the piping industry, Wayne can tell you that's permitted. You work in the piping industry, right? Very common. And I'm sure he has the ability to do that, but we're not going to put petroleum in it. We're going to hold a bridge up with it. And according to our specifications, it has to have a biking bar. Now, he can either cut a piece of pipe from what he's got, uh, split that piece of pipe, shrink it, slide it down in. It has to be of the same grade of material. So he's achieved that if he uses a piece of pipe. Uh, I've seen welding contractors take a piece of flat bar, wrap it around the outside of the pipe. Uh, then they'll cut that, shrink it a little bit more, and slide that inside. That's okay, too. If he's welded up very many pipe piles and he's had to put this backing bar in, He's going to buy one because he can buy one for about 35 bucks and there's there's no time no labor involved just slipping into place um, these uh, factory box backing bars even have even have a pin that breaks off that sets the gap for him so he puts his backing bar in place puts his two pieces of pipe together uh, puts several tacks in it breaks breaks those pins off and he's ready to weld but he has to have that backing bar, no matter what he tells you. Now, if uh, and just notice we've got two details here. If they're driving the piles, you're going to see this. If if uh, if it's a, a drilled shaft and they're using pipe piles, and it's going to be the horizontal configuration, he's probably going to weld that on the ground, and he's going to be uh, he's going to be, to be welding both pieces. He still needs the backing bar. If you look at the photograph here, this was actually done down east, galvanized pile. The guy thought he was finished. Uh, several of you have seen this photograph, and we use this in the old field weld inspection class. Um, it's a perfect example of underfill, undercut, overlap, and so we've used it in just about every class that we've had when it comes to field welding issues. The bottom photograph, now that's not a perfect weld, but it's acceptable. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a perfect weld to be accepted. Okay, now very quickly we're going to just skim over the rest of these welding procedures. The next welding procedure, concrete girder, just notice first of all in the comments that I've also included uh, the comment about 250 degrees for the last numeric, 300 degrees for the uh, proximity to concrete. Um, how are they going to achieve that? Well, it's their job to prove it. Okay, well, I've got a photograph. Well, I've got a slide uh, here that we're going to look at in just a minute uh, of an of a infrared barometer. A lot of, a lot of the uh, construction offices have those. Keep one thing in mind about these temperature indicating crayons. The only thing they tell you is that you're either hotter or colder than the temperature specified. Okay, so for example, I've got a 100 degree temp stick, I've got a 250 degree temp stick. 
I heat up a piece of metal, I strike it with the 100 degree temp stick and it melts. Okay, it's hotter than 100 degrees. I strike it with a 250 degree temp stick and it doesn't melt. So I'm less than 250. That's all I know. I'm between 100 and 250. Now this is what I'm getting at with this. Those temp sticks are expensive, about 28 bucks a piece. So what, what I've seen a lot of these welding contractors do, they'll just get the 250. Okay, don't let them do this to you. They pull out a 250 degree temp stick. They're welding on these concrete girders. All right, it's 250 for the elastomeric pad on the bottom. Okay, it's 300 degrees for the embedded steel on the, on the concrete girder. Okay, they just get finished. That's a big weld. It's a 7 16 weld. So multiple passes they have to put on this, on, on this joint. And, and they want to weld everything in one place before they move on. Okay, so they put all of their weld in one place. They pull out their 250 degree temp stick and, and they strike it on the bottom plate and it doesn't melt. Okay, so they're good. Well, because of thermodynamics, heat going up, they put all these passes in, that, that embed steel could be hotter. So if they take that 250 degree temp stick and they strike that embed steel and it melts, they're above 250 degrees. Don't let them tell you, yeah, but I'm allowed 300. Okay, the only thing you know is he is above 250. Okay, so if he doesn't have the 300 degree temp stick, to verify that he's under 300, tell him he needs to stop, he needs to move around. Okay, so on the, on the rest of the joints, he needs to weld a pass, then move to another joint, weld a pass, then come back. You see what I mean? And that will usually take care of, even with the 250 degree requirement. So there, you're very limited on what you can do with a temp stick. Okay, next, next welding procedure. Uh, steel girder, SIP angle. Uh, I tell you what, when you get a chance, just look over these things. They're going to be very familiar to you. Uh, if, if it's anything that you've dealt with, uh, stud welding, biggest problem there. That they want to put one pass. That it's a five sixteenths weld. Okay, I tell you what, we're going to. Let me see if I can get this slideshow presentation going, and. We're going to look at just a couple of slides here and we are finished. Uh, let me get Kevin to unlock this. It's Lee. We covered most of the material that's in this slide slideshow presentation. There are just a few slides that I want you to take a look at. And that's not one of them. That's okay. <laughs> Okay, we've gone over the purpose. Which way? That's good. You got it. We've gone over that AWS code requirements, uh, what to look for, well discontinuities, the inspection. We've gone over all of these things. We've gone over those issues, common welding applications. We've talked about these things. Pop bearings are coming on the next revision. You'll see that in the table of contents. Same thing on soldier piles. Welder certifications, proper equipment. We've gone over all of these. All welds are complete. When does the welding inspection take place? Okay, it takes place before, during, and after. Okay, because of all the things we've talked about, you've got to make sure the fit up is good. If you don't, the contractor's going to get something by on you. Okay, so before he gets started, look at the fit up. That's before weld. While he's welding, check the preheat temperatures. Make sure that's right. Okay. Uh, after he gets finished, make sure he's done the proper cleaning, make sure the weld size are proper, make sure he's got everything welded. Field welder certification program, we talked about that, that was 2006. Most of this, I, again, it's old, it's old news. <coughs> 8018, we did not go over 8018, let me just touch basis on that. We're afraid that, that we've got a situation out there where we have conditions where they should be using 8018 and it's not happening. Where they need to be using 8018 is anywhere that, that the material is not painted. Okay, because 8018 has the same corrosion characteristics as weathering steel. Okay, so if you've got if you've got a bridge, the ends are painted, you've got an interior bent, and the interior bent's not painted, but you've got sole plates that need to be welded, it's okay for him to use 7018 on the end bits because then they're going to be touched up with the same kind of paint that, that we're using on the end of the girders. If you've got an interior bent 
and there is no paint that's going to take place, if he welds that up with 7018, we're going to have corrosion at a rate just like we would if we'd have built that bridge out of A36 material, of just regular mild steel material. Okay, so he needs to be using 8018. It doesn't have anything to do with strength. It has to do with corrosion characteristics. Okay, so that it will weather at the same rate as what that weathering steel is going to corrode. Okay, if he wells it with 7018, I don't know how long it would take. 15 years, maybe 20 years, bridge maintenance may go up there and find that they have had so much section loss in that weld area that it's starting to crack. Okay, I don't think we're going to have any bridge failures, but we're going to have some maintenance issues in some of those areas, or, or possibly. So 8018, if it's not coated, electrode storage, we talked about that. Uh, nine hour, again, with, uh, notice with the 8018 that they are not as moisture resistant, just a two hour. Uh, exposure time on those 8018 rods. Talked about all of these things, temperatures. This is a, uh, this is the the, uh, the gun that most most uh, offices have one of those. They actually have a cheaper version. Uh, you can go to Northern Tool and Equipment and buy one of those for 70 bucks. So if you have a welding contractor and he's crying about you know these temp sticks, they're consumables. They cost 28 bucks a piece. <coughs> Just tell them, go by Northern, Northern Tool and Equipment and see what they have to offer. Okay, 28 bucks and consumable, 70 bucks and it'll last until he drops it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, fillet welds, groove welds, we talked about. Just a couple of illustrations here on, on what uh, welds should and probably should not look like. Or technique. Purpose of inspection, of course, make sure it's right. Visual inspection, uh, remove that slag. Now you've got uh, you've got the AWS uh, statement on on that being a requirement. Fillet weld gauges, um, how you use that fillet weld gauge. Uh, we went over, we went over this for people who were in the field weld inspection class. You've got a fillet weld gauge. You measure this leg, then you turn that fillet weld gauge around, and you measure this leg. Both legs, if, you, if one leg is 5 sixteenths and the other leg is a quarter inch, it's a quarter inch weld. It's not a 5 sixteenths or you don't average them out. It's the smaller of the two legs. Okay, we talked about undercut and porosity and overlapping cracks and crater cracks you're probably not going to see. We talked about underfill. Uh, arc strikes, arc, arc strikes need to be removed with grinding. Um, if you if you see any kind of evidence or it, it's uh, it's pretty gross, give us give us a call and we will bring dye penetrant testing equipment out and we will make sure there are no uh, micro fractures in the steel. Undercut we talked about porosity. Please call us if you have porosity. Overlap. I like I like the illustration we have in the book better than this. Cracks. No cracks are allowed. I don't think you're going to see cracks, but if you do, give us a call. That's one, that's one thing I didn't talk about too much. Uh, whenever you have a crack, of course, it has to be removed, but not only, not only removed, it has to be evaluated. So we bring ultrasonic equipment out, and we find out the extent of the crack, and all of the crack has to be removed. We'll use our ultrasonic equipment to make sure there's nothing left, and then they have to go two inches in each direction beyond the crack, and then deposit good weld metal back in place. Crater cracks, I don't think you will see. Underfill, we talked about arc strikes, soldier piles is what we're looking at right here. If you've got a lot of arc strikes, if, if you've got just a couple, I don't think it's going to be an issue. Uh, really with soldier piles it may not be an issue either, but if you run into, into this and, and, and it looks pretty gross like this, uh, give us a call and we will bring the equipment out and do some testing. Underfield craters, special considerations, it's, really, it's talking about the weather, we went over all of those issues. Stay in place forms, non destructive testing. High performance steel. Do not watch the arc. Review, review questions. Any questions? Guys, I guess we're done. <laughs>